everyone, I'm Joanna Penn from thecreativepen.com and today I'm here with Mindy McCorse. Hi Mindy! Hi, how are you? Good, thanks for coming on the show. So just a quick introduction, Mindy is a freelance copywriter and marketing specialist as well as the editor of the Barefoot Writer magazine. So Mindy, start by telling us a bit more about you and your writing background. Well, thank you, Joanna. Thank you so much for having me. I'm delighted to get to talk with you today. Um, I guess, you know, I started like a lot of new writers where my dream was always to be a fiction author uh, and writing is always my hobby, but I never took it seriously to the extent of pursuing it professionally because I didn't want to be a starving artist. <laughs> so um, I, I took the university route. I, I got a master's degree in management and... Um, about a year into my first real job, I I was ready to retire. I hated it. <laughs> um, it was actually a great job. I worked with fascinating people, and it was at a university. But I didn't like the fact that um, in total my commute was about two hours a day. Mm. I rarely got to see my fiancé because he had conflicting hours. I really didn't care for my boss <laughs> because although a nice lady, she was very hyper-controlling. And... Um, Nobody wants that. So I actually started looking for alternatives early into my career, and um, that was about the time that I received a letter from a company called American Writers and Artists, Inc., and they started talking about this profession called copywriting, which I had never heard of. If you'd asked me then what a copywriter was, I would have thought it was somebody who worked with a lawyer to you know, copyright terms and products. Um, but I looked into it. I was intrigued. I read more about it. The more I researched, the more I discovered that um, it, it was a legitimate profession and, and very much seemed like the best kept secret um, mm. for the writing industry. Um, because what appealed to me was that you could get a quick start in copywriting and you could actually make a um, sizable income in a relatively short amount of time. Um, and that the, the odds of success were very much in anybody's favor if you put yourself out there. So I did that. I literally put myself out there. I quit my job and decided the next day, I'm a copywriter. <laughs> and um, I'll confess, it, wasn't, uh, it didn't happen as quickly as I'd hoped mm -hmm. uh, because a lot of uh, training went into the specifics of what it takes to be a successful copywriter and write persuasive copy. Um, I needed... To, I didn't really start being successful until I reached out to other copywriters and um, attending conferences within the industry and realizing that it was a business mm. because I had the romantic idea of being a writer that, oh, I'm going to stay at home and I'm going to write things and people are going to pay me so much money. <laughs> and while that's true, <laughs> it's also a business. And it's a, for me, it was a big mentality shift. And so um, now it's been about five years. Uh, five and a half years now I've been successfully freelancing as a copywriter from home mm -hmm. and um, I it's 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 just turned out to be wonderful I would never go back Wow it's a really great story and I love how positive and enthusiastic you are I mean I feel the same way you know about d working from home and you know working for yourself all those things you said um, but let's go back to basics and I've got a whole load of things I'm going to follow up on but the first of all is for people who don't know what copywriting is um, can you explain so most of my listeners will write fiction or non-fiction books and they might have jobs that involve writing but what sets copy writing in particular a part? Right, and that's a great question um, because many people will look at any kind of writing and say it's still communication, right? Mm -hmm. the, the easiest way to describe it is that copywriting, it's persuasive writing, but the, the defining difference is that it asks somebody to do something. So it has a call to action. So instead of a fiction book that, that entertains or informs or editor, editorial that teaches you about something, copywriting finishes with a specific call to action, whether it's for you to enroll in something or um, make a purchase or sign up for something or make a phone call. So any, anywhere where you see a call to action, that's, that's traditional copywriting. And it does, especially because we have the internet, um, it does sort of reach into a lot of different areas now where there may not be a specific request. At the end of something that you read, you know, it doesn't have to be a black and white question asking somebody to do something, but the general underlying theme is that you are persuading somebody to do something, to take some kind of action. Mm. You, you 
use the word persuasive, you know, writing there, and people might be thinking, oh, that sounds a bit icky or a bit kind of marketing-y or not the type of writing they want to do. So can you maybe, you know, talk a bit about being authentic and how it doesn't have to be like that, but it can still work? Absolutely. And that's another great question because I think one of the things that, um, like you said, can turn people off of this type of writing, and initially it confused me as well, is that people see it as um, sales writing. Mm -hmm. And they say, well, I don't want to be a salesperson. I'm, I'm not in sales. And I feel very much that way. I, 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 the sales profession is not, would never, never fit for me. Um, so a good way to look at it is that if you are writing a message that connects with the right person, then it's actually a very valuable, very wonderful thing. And we see copywriting virtually every day, not necessarily in advertisements, but if you subscribe to a magazine that, you know, informs your beliefs or directs your hobbies, and it's something that you really enjoy, chances are you read a copywriting piece that attracted you to that magazine, that basically told you about the magazine and the benefits and the features that you would get from it, and and connected you there. If you donate to a nonprofit or a charity, chances are it's something that you're passionate about but you are connected to it by reading a letter that explained what that charity does and why they're committed to their work and it resonated with your core beliefs and values and then told you about how you could become involved. That's copywriting. And so, you know, yes, there is an element of hype to some types of copywriting, but it's all um, it's all dependent on the niche or you know the subject in which you write. And then that goes back to, as the writer, it goes back to what you are most interested in. So if you look at the health industry, for, for example, a copywriter who writes for the health industry is typically going to write copy that has a more colorful degree of language, you know? That's a nicer way of saying hype, but hype doesn't always have to be negative. If you are writing about, um, let's say, a heart medication that could save somebody's life then having a bold title and something that really grabs somebody and then informs them and then turns out to be something that is actually a life-saving action for them then mm. you know there's no sales element to that it actually is a very rewarding fulfilling kind of thing so there are other types of copywriting like writing for the business to business industry mm -hmm. that um, really has no element of hype at all. It's actually very um, calm writing, if you will. And if you're writing for the business-to-business -business industry, then let's say you write a white paper, which is one facet of a copywriting project. And a white paper is really just a very calm way of explaining, here's what this complicated product does, here's how it can help you, here's how we sell it. So copywriting has many levels. Mm. It all depends on what you as the writer are comfortable communicating with you know I personally can't do very bold claims you know I, I like the uh, the more mellow friendly appeal some people are excited when it comes to you know a big bold headline and letter that really energizes people and gets them going so it's nice because it's very specific to what uh, you as the writer are interested in mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, I, just for the listeners, um, we can we can hear your lovely puppies in the background, and um, I, I just wanted to explain to everyone so they don't think there's a zombie apocalypse coming. <laughs> right, right. We can hear this growling. Sure I apologize. I, I I would lock them out, but they'd bark from downstairs. Oh, no. It's and so awesome. It adds a bit I've of color. Two, two baby cavaliers that keep me entertained. <laughs> no. Um. So when you talk about you talk a bit about hype there and and bold things, but as fiction writers for example, we have to write a back blurb and we have to write an Amazon description that makes people want to buy our books. And that often includes a bit of hyperbole, which is another word for being bold and, you know, a little bit salesy, right? It's to make, you know, like I'm in my thrillers, we that the heroine saves the world, you know, from destruction. You've got to make it really big. So I want authors to really be thinking that this totally applies to them. So um, with that in mind, can you give us a couple of tips as to what to do when we're trying to write copy like say a back blurb absolutely um i would say the first tip is to look for well first of all speak to your reader 
I think a lot of people, um, a lot of writers fall into the habit of talking about themselves when they write. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're describing your book, for instance, you might say, I wrote this book that mm -hmm. I really felt passionate about and I love telling this story. And really, whenever you're using the word I, that's a red flag. Use the word you for your reader. You know, you will enjoy this book. You will be taken away to a far off land. And, and then dig beyond the, the features and look for benefits. That's that's a major copywriting. Mm -hmm. um, well, that, I guess that that's one of the most important elements of copywriting is when you look past features and you dig for benefits. So if you think about it, any reader interested in buying your book doesn't just want a book. They don't want something that's 246 pages that will keep them busy for three weeks. Mm -hmm. They want something that they can sit down with that will take them away, that will help them forget their normal everyday life and maybe make them feel like a heroine or like a wizard or, you know, basically whatever the purpose of your book is, that's what you want to tell your reader about and you want to really underscore benefits over features. Mm -hmm. um, and the second tip I would say is to uh, include a call to action. We talked about this at the beginning of our conversation, and so it's it's interesting because in some ways you think you don't need to spell it out. If you have something written on the back of a book or if you have something, something on a web page, obviously the person reading the copy should know that you want them to click the link or you want them to open the book. But if you tell them to do it, they are more likely to do it. <laughs> and lots of research underscores this fact. Um, it's it's the same thing in um, in copywriting. One of the major tricks you might say that we use is is you can have a hyperlink, for instance. And obviously, if it's underlined and colored on the internet, most everybody knows that means it's a hyperlink. And that means you can click. But if you actually spell it out and say "click here now," your click rate will skyrocket. And it's just because. It's just a natural human thing. We like to be told what to do. It makes things easier. It means you don't have to think about it. You just do it. And so if you want somebody to click this link, buy this book, open this book, enjoy this book, tell them. So always include a call to action. Mm, brilliant. I think those are fantastic things. Now, um, one thing that's quite common in, you know, all online marketing now is blogging. And authors are no different. You know, certainly nonfiction authors, I think, really do need a blog. And many fiction authors are now blogging. So, but one of the things I see that people get very, very wrong is headlines. So I wondered if you could maybe uh, explain what a good headline is. You know, what make, what's the definition of a good he headline, I get, and give us some examples. Right. Well, again, um, it goes back to wanting to communicate with your reader. So using, you know, the, the simplest trick is just to use the word you and not I, or at least to think in terms of what do you want as opposed to what do I want. Um, looking for benefits. If you include a benefit in your headline, mm -hmm. people are much more likely to be interested. You know, you can say new great book, but what, what is that? <laughs> that's, that's, that's actually a headline I've seen, but it doesn't really tell me anything interesting mm -hmm. or useful. Um, so look for benefits that can say things like um, what kind of experience you want your reader to have or what they might learn from mm -hmm. reading your material. Uh, and then another trick that I, that I always turn to, um, uh, not trick necessarily, it's a tool. It's actually taught by American Writers and Artists, Inc., which mm -hmm. is the company that I learned all my copywriting. Um, knowledge from and they uh, they have a process they call it the four U's when writing any headline mm -hmm. where you want your headline to be useful you want it to be ultra specific anything vague is much more likely to be glossed over by somebody because you see vague headlines all the time you want it to be um, let's see there are four <laughs> it's always hard to think of all four at the same time we've got useful ultra specific urgent um, so if you can include any word that inspires urgency like like now or today or um, you know recently just using words that that make the headline feel more timely and then the last one is unique so don't write a headline just like everybody else would write it use words that you don't normally see in a headline use words that inspire curiosity mm -hmm. um, I know one of the most famous headlines it was actually in a mailer and to be honest, I can't remember what, what the advertisement was for, but it was a mailer that went out um, several years ago, and the headline was, What Never Ever to Eat on an Airplane. And so that's something that it's very unique. You know, it immediately makes you want to read more and find out, mm -hmm. my gosh, if I'm going to be riding on an airplane, what, what should I avoid eating? What's going to make me sick or, or upset? Or, you know, what I, I need to know more. Um, 
another very popular headline that I can think of off the top of my head, it was for a Magalog advertising a financial product that, that talked about the plague of the black debt. And again, it's something that's very unique. It, 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 it inspires curiosity. Um, so anything like that. Yeah. But, it, but also the examples you gave, they were still, it was still obvious what it was about. Because I think authors often try and be clever with headlines and write kind of, you know, if you think about a book title of a fiction novel, it can be clever. That's fine. But when you're doing a headline, it, it can't be obscure, can it? It's got to have a promise in a way. That's a great point. Yeah, cute and clever should never have any role in a headline. So if, if especially if you write something and you think, oh, you know, that's very original, that's very cute, nobody would think of that, then maybe you should second guess it because the more um, I'm not I'm not saying that your headline should be common because like I pointed out before, it should be unique. But if it's something that I, I wish I had some more examples, I can send you some which might be useful. Um, but yeah, if it's something that that really just speaks to you and won't resonate with your core audience, then it just needs to be canned and start right over. Mm, no, absolutely. Well, one example would be like it's um, NaNoWriMo at the moment, National Novel Writing Month, and um, I've seen blog posts like um, day 15 of my book, you know, as a headline. Instead, oh. but instead one should write something like, um, you know, how I learned to write characters well or you know how you can write characters well you know exactly be, be more specific about the actual content of the of the article right and then that's and that's a perfect example because that gives the reader a benefit it says my gosh i'm working on my own NaNoWriMo book and i i need help with character writing and this person has something there's my yeah. benefit um and and you can add a few other Let's see. I, I love building on headlines like this. This is this is something we often do in peer review groups where somebody puts a line out there and then everybody mm. um, adds to it um, how you can write characters well in 30 minutes or less, mm. you know, um, and then you add your degree of urgency or how you can write characters well in 30 minutes or less when you're at a coffee shop. <laughs> or for surrounded by busy people. <laughs> yeah, or, or for historical fiction or for romance, you know, make it specific. And that's where the ultra specificity comes in. The more you can drill down, while while short headlines are effective, the more you can drill down and tell your reader what they're going to get from the post, the better it is. And a, another good approach to headline writing is to write your post first and then write your yes. headline. Yeah. Because and and I even deal with this in many of my copywriting projects. It's very difficult to get a strong headline right off mm -hmm. and then write to suit. But if you write your post or your article or whatever it is you're working on, then you can go back through it and you can say, gosh, you know, I really touched on that benefit and this part here is really strong. I should highlight that in my headline. And then you go back and do it. Chances are it'll be much stronger and it'll take you half the time that it normally would have taken to craft a powerful headline. Yeah, no, and I love headlines. And one last thing on headlines. It's very important to get a good headline so it gets shared on social media, right? People just don't click otherwise. Yes. Actually, that, that's a great point, and in that case, it's always important to look at your headline. Once you have a headline that you're comfortable with and you feel like it really speaks to your reader, look at it and see if there's any way you can move the benefit to the front. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you think that the most powerful benefit of, of the headline that we were just discussing is um, learning about character development in a short period of time or learning about character development for historical fiction, put that in the first few words. If you can flip the sentence around, just because when it gets shared, oftentimes you, you never know how much of your headline will be chopped off. Mm. And so that way you're getting the core benefit early on so people are more likely to see it and, and benefit from it. No, that's that's fantastic. Excellent. So um, I wanted to come back to you talking about your business and, and that. And you, you use the phrase, you put yourself out there um, and, you know, you've got your own website, you've got your own business. So many people have their own small businesses as writers. I think we are as authors with small businesses. How did you put yourself out there and, and what are your best tips for marketing yourself as a brand? Ooh, well, <laughs> I think this is, uh, I think it's actually a very scary thing for any new writer to put yourself out there, especially because it's very common to feel vulnerable and to feel judged even when, when you're first beginning and you're putting your writing out there and you feel like it's something that's very 
um, deeply connected to who you are. But I think the two important things to remember are, one, um, a lot of people are in your shoes, a lot of people will relate, and they won't judge you. They will want to connect with you or learn more about you because they relate to you. So, so move past that fear. Um, and then know, I think, also that anything can be improved. Um, and, and Joanna, I remember seeing, I think it was one of your blog posts, where I loved, I loved the fact that you uh, included a picture of early edits to one of your yeah, books. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just bleeding in red. It was beautiful. Because I think as an, as an early author, it's, it's so simple to, it, it's very easy to fall into the trap where you write something and you feel so connected to it that having it torn up makes you feel torn up as opposed to realizing that it can make everything stronger. And so this all ties into putting yourself out there and just going for it. I see too many writers who are very, um, they go for, forward with a lot of trepidation because they're afraid of feeling judged. So they don't put up a profile on LinkedIn, which would be my number one first recommendation. They don't put out a website, which is my number two absolute recommendation because um, they'd rather... Uh, somebody see their writing, love it, pick it up, publish it, pay them for it, whatever, first, so that they have that credibility, and then they put themselves out there. But most of the time, 99% of the time, it's not going to work that way. You need to establish your presence, like you were saying, a brand, brand yourself. Mm -hmm. um, I think in, in the publishing world, a lot of um, publishers, a lot of agents will be more impressed if you can say, Here's my LinkedIn profile. I'm connected to all these people in the industry, all these potential readers. Here's my website. I have this blog with 20,000 subscribers. Then they can say, okay, not only do you write, and ideally they like what you write, but you're also committed to putting yourself out there. You're committed to connecting with your audience. And because that's a major part of being a successful writer, you have to be able to connect with your audience. You have to be able to know what they want. So... So it comes back to putting yourself out there. So like I mentioned earlier, I think um, when you're first beginning, I think putting up a LinkedIn profile is the most important thing you can do simply because it's easy, it's quick, it's free. Um, it's, it's, kind of a, it's kind of a stepping stone, if you will, you know, into the greater pool of the Internet. And when you're putting together your LinkedIn profile, um, one of the best uh, pieces of advice I've heard other writers share is that you want to include things that make you unique, that showcase who you are, where your writing comes from. Don't talk about the fact that you worked for Starbucks when you were 15 years old, unless maybe it you know factors into your writing in some way or it helps color your personality. But when people read these LinkedIn profiles, they're, they're trying to find out not necessarily every detail of your specific professional background or even personal background. They're trying to find out who you are and what you want to represent as a writer. So in copywriting, for instance, this is where people, we, we, this is where we recommend that people emphasize what types of markets they write for, what types of copy they write, mm -hmm. um, what their um, motivation is. You know, not irrelevant details. And so once you have your LinkedIn profile up and you start connecting with people who are relevant in your industry and absolutely connect with other writers, this is another important um, distinction, I think, to making the leap is that many people fall into the trap of thinking that other writers and other copywriters do this a lot, that they're your competition. Yeah. And, <clears throat> excuse me. And it's not the case at all. I, I actually felt this when I first started out. Um, and the two things to remember are that, one, there is so much, there's such a great need for writing, for content writing, for paid content writing, that there will always be enough to go around. Um, and I think in fiction, the, the, the important thing to remember is that there's such a variety of stories to be told. It's not like you're competing necessarily because you have your own voice. And so that's the first thing to recommend, that there's, there's plenty of space for everybody. The, the second thing to know is that um, writers are your support, they're your community. They're the only people who are really going to understand what you're going through. So connect with writers and then absolutely start reaching out to your core audience and the people that you think are most likely to read your content or who will be most likely to pay for your content. Um, I'm sorry, this answer is becoming very yeah, long. Yeah, <laughs> no, no, that's great. And um, no, that last bit there, uh, I use the word cooperation, which is becoming more more common now. It's like cooperation, co you know, competition. You know, we are, you know, we, we're in the same business, but we all help each other and we all, ref you know, we blog about each other and we promote each other and, and that we all rise up together in that way. There's no, you know, I love that positivity around. I think, I mean, there are some people who don't feel that way, but... At, 
those of us who do, we resonate with each other, I think. That's, that's so true. Yeah, and you know, from a copywriting perspective, every year I attend um, the, the major copywriting conference. It's, it's the AWAI Boot Camp in Florida every fall. And I've been going for the last seven years. <clears throat> Excuse me. And and I've met people there who have become my, my close friends whom I can relate to and bounce ideas off of. And I've also met people there who are very guarded about their writing practices and their fees and things like that. What I've seen over the course of the last several years is that the people who really open up and share, they're the ones who are the most successful. They're the ones who are really climbing into the upper echelons of copywriting. The ones who are guarded and closed off, they're, they're either stagnant or they haven't made it at all. And it, it just goes to show that there's, there's power in community, there's power in learning uh, from each other, and in believing that you have your own voice and that mm. reaching out to somebody else isn't going to rob you of anything. Yeah, no, I I totally agree with you, and I think that that's also in you know in, it, for a lot of authors, it's realizing this isn't a zero sum game. Like there, like you said, there's enough for all of us. There's I really believe there's enough for everyone, um, and it's uh, it's and I think it's better for us to feel that way anyway. It feels much. I feel much more positive working in this industry, feeling like this than than people who are you know not think it's all kind of crashing down and you know it's not happening. So that's right. What, now, um, I wanted to bring uh, talk a bit there. You mentioned paid content and you've mentioned, you know, making a good living and that you wouldn't have given up your job in order to be like a poor writer. You know, you didn't, there's no poverty consciousness around that, which I think is brilliant. Now, I know that some people are, are, are saying, well, how, but how do you make money copywriting? Because there are a lot of people who do try this and don't make any money at all. Um, and there are a lot of places that pay really badly for writing. So how do you find, how do you actually make money with copywriting as a business? You know, obviously right. that's a massive topic. Just, you know. <laughs> no, it, it, but it's, it's a great question because it's, you know, it's the number one driving force behind um, being able to pursue this lifestyle versus just dabbling and always treating it as a hobby. I will say um, in a lot of ways it goes back to connection like we were just talking about um, and knowing where to look. So you know, depending on your your writing goals, I think that's where it all starts. What are your writing goals and what are your income goals? Because I know several people who um, are passionate about writing and they're only interested in writing fiction. Mm -hmm. um, and the money part is irrelevant because either they have it coming in from another source or um, they're, they're just, for whatever reason, that's, that's just not their focus. But I know plenty of people who love writing, they do want to be fiction authors, but they also need a way to support themselves. So they turn to copywriting as an immediate way to bring in cash and then they work on growing their fiction fan base and um, and you know looking for revenue there over over a longer period of time. So as a copywriter, um, <laughs> I I laugh because I remember my early days of copywriting sitting in front of the monitor and thinking Hey, what now? <laughs> gonna pay me, and how are you going to find me? And um, so this also builds on what we were talking about earlier: um, putting yourself out there. If, mm -hmm. if first of all, if you have a LinkedIn profile and if you have a website that talks about your skills, those are from a copywriting perspective, those are two of the most important things you can do because it's a way of showing and not telling any potential client yeah. that look, I'm here, I'm professional. Any website that you have out there and blog post is going to be an example of your writing ability, mm -hmm. and it's much it's a much stronger way to approach any prospective client than a simple email saying I would like to write for you. Yeah. Um, the next step is knowing who to approach, and in general, um, I know there are exceptions to this rule, but in general, magazines and newspapers do not pay well. But those are the first places people think of when it comes to writing content yeah. for pay. You can do it. I've I've written for both, and and it pays pennies. That's yeah. that's where you get the idea of the starving artist. And there are several websites. Um, I don't want to pinpoint any specific one, but there are websites where you can go. Um, you know, and there's there are just tens of thousands of other freelance writers on there um, looking to connect with clients, and the clients are looking for the lowest bidder, yes. and you won't make any money there either. Yeah. So um, if you're really looking to grow your income. The two things, well, let's see, the three things to focus on are first, your niche. Um, you're going to make more money more quickly if you pick a certain topic mm -hmm. because then you can present yourself as a specialist as opposed to a generalist, mm -hmm. which is which is always an important 
distinction. Um, a lot of the niches that copywriters I know focus on are business to business, like I mentioned, mm -hmm. which is actually one of the more lucrative fields just because there are far more business to business um, clients willing to pay copywriters. Uh, I wish I, I can't think of the numbers right now. I can get them That's to you later. You know, tens of thousands. Um, huge demand for business to business copywriters. Um, the health market is, is, mm -hmm pays very well. The financial market pays very well. A lot of people write for nonprofits. It doesn't pay as well, but you yeah. can make a great living and you get fulfilled uh, on top of that. Um, you know, and then you can drill down to even more specific markets. One copywriter friend of mine writes for the pet industry. So mm -hmm. any business or, um, you know, entity involved in pets and pet supplies and pet wellness, she writes specific copy for them. So she charges very high fees. Um, so, so you want to decide on a niche. But then it really comes down to connecting with somebody who understands the value of good copy. Mm -hmm. And this can be anybody. It can be a small business person. It can be a Fortune 500 company. But the defining feature is if you approach somebody, you say, I'd like to write copy for you. I, you know, I, I think that your sales letter could be improved. I think your website could be improved. Um, if they don't know what a copywriter is or they don't understand the power of communication, you can still have a conversation with them. You can go forward with that, but chances are they will not pay the high fees. If you instead connect with a marketing association like the DMA or like AWAI because they have several job boards where clients come to them and they say, we need a copywriter, we need a good copywriter, those are the people that you want to connect with because those are the ones who already understand the value of good copy. They know that your rates are fair because although they may be extraordinarily high compared to your you know, average low bidder on, on a on a bidding website, they give the client such a huge payoff in revenue that it's, you know, it's a no-brainer for mm -hmm. them. Yeah. Easily. And so that comes back to connecting with, um, you know, in the case of copywriting, connecting with copywriting organizations who can give you access to a jobs board where marketers are willing to um, put their jobs up and pay high fees. Um, you can absolutely look for clients yourself, mm -hmm. but what you want to look for, besides the idea of whether they understand what copy is, you want to look for somebody that has um, you know, a, a consistent business presence. It, you want to look for somebody who's already putting good content out there. So, so let's say you have two businesses and you like them equally and you're trying to decide between them, but you go to their website. One of them has um, a regular blog. One of them has downloadable reports. Mm -hmm. um, white papers, uh, an entire social media profile set up, they're an ideal prospect of client because you can tell that they understand the value of content. The other business, let's say, just has a website that's got five web pages and that's all. Yeah. The, the general thinking is to think, well, this website over here, you know, they could really use my help because they don't have any of this content. And while that's true, the problem is they may not value any of that content. And mm -hmm. you can have that conversation with them. You can teach them, but it's going to be an uphill climb to teach them that they need it all and that they need to pay you well for it. Mm -hmm. This other client over here, they already know. And if you can beat what they have already up there and make their uh, conversion stronger, then, then chances are they're, they're going to give you a really great opportunity. Yeah, no, all that that's really fantastic and I love I love hearing about writing for a living from a different angle. It's very interesting to me. Um so I I wondered if you can talk a bit about the barefoot writer. Um and, you know what, what what is it and um you know what what does that how does that help people if they're interested in this? Absolutely. It's um it's 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 a project dear to my heart um because it's it's how I got started and um, what it is essentially is AWAI has, um, you know, they've built up this incredible copywriting community mm -hmm. of people who are growing their businesses and they're making, you know, incredible, well, I, I want to say incredible sums of money, but I should, I should add a cave caveat that, um, it depends on what you want in yes. terms of earning money. You know, if you're comfortable, if you love your full-time job, but it doesn't earn enough money for you and you'd like maybe $20,000 on the side part-time, that's what copywriting can give you. If you want to go full-time and you want to make six figures, copywriting can give you that as well. So mm -hmm. that's where AWAI has specialized. But what happens is that a lot of people come in, you know, much like I did and say, copywriting, what is that? <laughs> How do I get started? What do I do? And um, because of the internet, the opportunities and the different types of writing have just exploded. And it's it's all very confusing and it's all very overwhelming. So they developed the Barefoot Writer um, as a monthly digital publication to essentially let people know about this world in in you know a fun and exciting way. It's not overwhelming. We 
we work on making it just basically a fun read for people who are interested in getting into this world. They'd like to know more. They're taking it one step at a time. And so I've been fortunate to work on the publication as editor, mostly because my uh, my own writing history is that of a barefoot writer, where I decided at an early age, look, you know, I'd love to be a writer. I'd love to get paid for it. I want to work from home. I really don't like having a boss, but I don't know how to get started. And then by by basically reaching out to what is now the barefoot writing community, I was able to learn. And so in the magazine, we aim to do that same thing where we let people know, here are some different types of opportunities you can get paid for as a writer. Here are some of the best ways to get your writing business up and going. Here are some answers to questions that come up, like, like how do I deal with this client issue? Or how do I set my fee structure? Or how do I pick a niche in the first place? Um, and then I think most importantly, we feature people who are actually living this life because mm -hmm. it goes back to showing and not telling and seeing somebody who may be very similar to you, who faces similar challenges or shares um, a similar belief system and seeing that they've succeeded. <coughs> Excuse me. It's, it's very inspiring. So we always feature people who are uh, successful at the Barefoot Writer Lifestyle. And then we feature writers who, um, who uh, are have encountered or on the verge of extreme success having either published books or you know made it into the upper echelons of fame and, and yeah. fortune and that's why we featured you Joanna, oh yeah because <laughs> we so enjoyed that i'm i'm on my way <laughs> and um yes uh, i do i feel like i'm on the way there but no i i love being in your um and i got some emails based on being in the barefoot writer you know and i know a lot of people are interested in writing fiction but what's so funny is i know my a lot of my fiction audience are probably really interested in copywriting so i think there's definitely a crossover and i think it's about as a writer co almost compartmentalizing the types of writing you you do um, if you want to do both okay Mindy well it's been great talking to you so where can people find you online the the easiest way is uh, you can find out about the barefoot writer at simply going to the barefoot mm -hmm. um, I do have my own website it's mtmcopywriting.com and you're welcome to go there to learn more about me um, or feel free to connect with me on Facebook or Twitter or LinkedIn it's Mindy McCorse on all counts and and absolutely any questions about copywriting or uh, making money writing uh, or this lifestyle in general I'm happy to field them because it's it's something that I'm I'm so blessed to be experiencing myself and, and anybody who wants to join I welcome them with open arms <laughs> oh well thanks so much for your time Mindy that was great thank you for having me I really appreciate it